On today's RPV City Talk, we visit with Rancho Palos Verdes Mayor Brian Campbell about the early release program AB 109 and how this affects the residents of the peninsula. Mayor Campbell discusses how RPV is making sure you stay safe. He describes to us what the city is doing to prevent further criminal activity. And finally, RPV Mayor Brian Campbell takes us down memory lane to his RPV City Council campaign from over eight years ago. All coming up next on RPV City Talk. Welcome to RPV City Talk. I'm Mark J. Dotti. On today's City Talk, we've got Rancho Palos Verdes Mayor Brian Campbell. Brian, thank you for being here today. Thanks for the invitation, Mark. It's always a pleasure. Recently, your uh, city council welcomed Commander Keith Swenson from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, who did a presentation on AB 109, the Early Release Program. What did you learn from this presentation? Well, in, in summary, what has happened is at the state level, they have dealt with overcrowding of the state prisons, not by building more space, but by pushing tens of thousands of these inmates down to the county level. The county level jails were already full, and so what that forced them to do is to push out people into the community much earlier than what their sentences would have called for. And to quote something that was pretty dramatic in the commander's presentation was that these days it's the norm that you serve about 10% of your sentence, which means if you're sentenced to a year in jail, you'll spend maybe a month. If you're sentenced to six months in jail or three months in jail, you are unlikely to spend any time in jail. It was really a pleasure to have Commander Swenson come to our council meeting personally, who also is a resident of our city. So he, right, he also <laughs> deals with the same issues that we deal with on a daily uh, on a daily basis, and give us a very frank, sobering report on the current state of crime in California and the Palos Verdes Peninsula, and specifically Rancho Palos Verdes. Uh, in the 2011, 12, 13 year time range when we started seeing this uptick in crime and we down at the street level in the, in the communities knew it was going on. Mm -hmm. There was a, a reluctance to address the obvious, which is crime is, uh, is, is going up. So I'm pleased that our city now at City Council has robustly jumped on this and we are fortunate that we run a tight enough ship here in Rancho Palos Verdes where we have the financial resources to be able to dedicate towards crime fighting. Before we go further, let's take a look at Commander Swinson's presentation. We're gonna get a little glimpse of what he talked about and then we'll be right back. Uh, thank you for uh, this uh, opportunity to give you this information, uh, Mayor Campbell and members of the city council and obviously the residents of Rancho Palos Verdes. Basically, what I'm going to be explaining to you is the challenges that are being faced by law enforcement, specifically your deputy sheriffs, um, since the passage of three significant uh, um, uh, legislative efforts. Uh, the first one is AB 109, which is known as realignment. Uh, done. The reason it uh, came into effect was to lower the population of state inmates. Uh, you can look back in 2007, the number of uh, uh, inmates that were in state uh, correctional facilities was 168,000. Today, in comparison, it's 122,000, which is 46,000 inmates that are no longer in state prison facilities. That is a direct result of um, the Realignment Act of 2011. So we started taking in more prisoners at the local county jails. Uh, of course, the county jails have a limitation. There's about 85,000 uh, jail beds throughout the uh, state. In LA County, there's about 20,000, and as a result, our populations increased. A follow-up a follow to that is Proposition 47. And basically, 47 did three things to lower the population in the local jails. They, had, they called with the three nons, which is uh, people or uh, uh, inmates that were uh, found guilty of a serious uh, felony, a violent felony, or non-sexual felony were eligible to be released early. 
Uh, another one that uh, it really affected when Prop 47 was it made um, misdemeanors uh, when it comes to petty thefts, uh, the first time is the same as the tenth time. And it allows certain offenders who have completed their sentence for those offenses to apply for the court and have the felony designated as a misdemeanor. Um, and it also erased a, a total of 198,000 felony convictions to date. Basically, those are all expunged records. Then you have, moving forward, Proposition 57. What Proposition 57 did, in effect, was it saves money through uh, an early release program. And what it does is the uh, early release programs is opportunities for career criminals to be treated as first-time offenders. So if somebody who's involved in a crime as a gang member, there used to be an enhancement because you're a gang member. Early parole exclusions of sentencing enhancements and the three strikes law could increase criminal gang activity within our communities, which we have seen not so much in Rancho Palos Verdes, but in other uh, areas we have seen a significant increase in, uh, in violent crimes. LASD has currently a caseload of 3,300 AB 109 absconders. These are all people that we don't know where they're at. They've committed felonies. They should be in custody, but they're now in our community. Uh, it's anticipated to have a comparable statistics and additional resources that would be uh, required, such as, according to the CDC, 61% of all prisoners recidivate within three years. Combined effects of these three initiatives have been problematic for our communities, especially in a marked increase in property crimes. Right now, if you commit a crime and you're sentenced to 120 days or less, in the, in the Los Angeles County Jail, we only serve 10% of the time, and with good time and work time, anything with 120 days or less, we book you and we immediately release you. Okay, welcome back. Uh, we are here with uh, Mayor Brian Campbell, the Mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes. And now that we've seen a little bit about with what uh, Commander Keith Swinson has discussed, uh, what is it that the city of RPV is doing to prevent uh, or to fight this uptick in crime that has happened in the past? Well, it started a couple of years ago, and the first and most important point is to note that we finally accepted the fact that even here in Rancho Palos Verdes, we've got a crime problem. And once that was fully embraced and recognized uh, by, uh, by staff and the council, we then started looking at what do we do about it. Uh, first off is we greatly increased our sheriff's budget. Sheriff's department does a terrific job out there, but we just needed more cars and, and more patrol people on the beat. We, they've got other assets out there, undercover assets, air assets, and we beefed all of those up. Our sheriff's budget has increased by well over $2 million a year the last couple of years. There's also new technology that's available out there that the city has taken the lead on in offering rebates to residents that, uh, that want to participate in Like it. on the ring cameras? The, ra the ring cameras, which are, which are the doorbell cameras. This is a device that probably didn't exist uh, 18 months or two years or so ago. Yeah. It's made here in Southern California, but it's a video camera that is accessible anywhere you are with a, with a smartphone. And when people come up to your house, ring the doorbell, it actually rings you. It, it does a lot of different things, but it covers your house, the entrance to your house. It actually has got a good enough camera on it where it can see across the street what might be happening at your neighbor's house. Yeah. It's a great crime fighting tool that residents can participate uh, in now. And this is very inexpensive stuff. I mean, we're talking less than $100 uh, to, to, to bring that sort of technology right to your, right to your house. Uh, but the more technology that we can deploy out there, the, the safer we're going to be, and these yeah. criminals will go the path of least resistance and go somewhere else, or hopefully we'll be able to put enough of them behind bars where it will make a significant difference. And you have um, the ALPR cameras, you've got a graffiti app, <clears throat> you've continued to support Neighborhood Watch. Um, t tell me a little bit about the graffiti app. The, the graffiti app has been a great addition to our, our uh, spectrum of crime fighting tools out there. I mean, it's a proven fact all over the country that that graffiti left unattended, left uncorrected, leads to both more graffiti and crime. Uh, 
city of LA, for example, has a graffiti hotline that you can call, right. and within a very short period of time, they'll come out and they'll paint over it uh, if it's on the side of your house or a commercial building or something. Uh, what we've done is we've uh, we've applied better technology where anybody can call in graffiti effectively, where there's an app that you can download onto your phone, and if you see graffiti, and it works in the open space, out on a trail, I've used it out on a You've out used on a the trail. app yourself? Absolutely, I've, I've used the app myself. And it allows you to take a photograph, it geolocates you, sends the information into the graffiti removal company. Within 24 hours, it's it's gone. Wow. There's, uh, I hike a lot with my with my family, There's there's one big concrete culvert that we look down on as part of the McBride Trail. They used to constantly be covered in, in major garish graffiti in years past. And it's gone now. And it is covered up so quickly, I think the perpetrators that used to come down there, and it's quite a hike to get down to it, yeah. have realized that all that work is wasted because <laughs> we'll just cover it up within 24 hours. So now they don't even bother. And so that's, that's proof that deploying this sort of technology really works. I mean, I mean, different areas get hit, you know, more with graffiti as these people that do this sort of uh, uh, crime, move right. around uh, and the a apps community. Gonna follow all that. Correct. The apps gonna know. Yeah. Correct. And then we have the ALPR cameras, which is something that we've invested heavily in here in the city, and those are the license plate readers that, if you're a a criminal that's you know jump bail or is or is wanted for a parole violation or if a car has been reported stolen it will instantly click on that when you enter our city limits that information gets pushed out to our now much more robust sheriff's uh, uh, presence here in the community and we get arrests weekly on that there was a couple of weeks ago a bentley that was stolen in beverly hills that triggered the ALPR here in Rancho Palos Verdes. Oh. And they arrested that person. So it's 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 really terrific technology that's having uh, that's having a good effect. And the neighborhood watch of course. I mean all of this is much more effective if individual residents or families get involved in it through the ring program, mm -hmm. through neighborhood watch. Our Rancho Palos Verdes neighborhood watch program has has been an award winner in years past. Uh, Gail Lorenzen has been the longtime head of it. She's been absolutely terrific. It makes a tremendous difference having community involvement right. in something like Neighborhood Watch as opposed to uh, having the government do it all for you. I mean, this really has got to work together. We've got to right. we've got to help our local government do its job better and and you will then get better local government so we're all in this together for sure uh looking back now your term's up in december there are two seats on the council open it's campaign season was there any advice you might give to our current people running for council <laughs> that's a good question because of rpv's partial term limits, uh, Councilman Anthony Misitich and myself are termed out. We've both served for eight years, and I say it's partial term limits because you need to step aside for two years, and if you really miss the work and are on, and, and want to come back, you have that opportunity to come back and, and do it again. And it's work. <laughs> As we know, it's well, work. <laughs> well, it, it, it is work, but so's coaching, you know, little league baseball team. So's volunteering to uh, be a troop leader, or yeah. working in your HOA, or being a docent or neighborhood watch. I mean, I mean, all of us are effectively volunteers. I mean, all of us choose to be engaged in our in our community, and that's that's terrific that we have this much engagement uh, on it. But we have six people that are running for these two seats. The field is set. Two of them will be serving on our council effective on December 5th, which is the last night that I'm actually in office. And, but, and of course, in this show, we can't necessarily ask you who you're behind correct. or who you're supporting. Um, but would you give them as a whole, what advice would you tell these uh, people running for, for office? First off, I would talk to them about the finding the joy in the job and what I mean by that is is fully embrace the fact that people are going to be looking to you 
to make the right decisions. That's going to benefit their neighborhood, the, the community. And to get out there and get in front of the homeowners associations, walk those precincts, talk to people who are not normally in front of the city council very often, but are excited to meet someone that's actually running for council. Uh, in my experience of walking precincts, I can hardly think of a negative experience I ever had. Most people in this city are excited that somebody that wants to serve on council actually came to the door to, to talk to them to find out what their concerns are for themselves or, or their community. What about those situations about disagreements or if you're not necessarily, you're seeing a resident face to face or, yeah. or in your case, sometimes behind the dais and you don't necessarily agree with that person. What, what, how do you handle that? Well, what, I, what I've found is that you need to be able to have spirited or robust debates, however you describe them. I, I think that's a good thing for the democratic process at, at, at any level. But also I think it's important to either have the discipline or develop the discipline that once you've had that debate at the council level or at the community level, and once a decision is made by the council, to be able to put it behind you and move on to the next item because very often you'll find that a person that you may have vigorously uh, disagreed with on one issue, be it a fellow council person or a member of the public, you'll be on the same side of an issue going forward. I mean, one thing that former, uh, former councilman Tom Long told mm -hmm. me, who I worked with my first two years on council before right. he was termed out, is that he always made a point of saying that every decision was going to have people that were, that were going to be happy with you and people that were not going to be happy with you. And so long as you worked hard to explain the basis of your decisions, then most people, even if they disagree with you, can live with that if they feel that you came to your decision honestly and fairly. Yeah, and, and you're going to see these same people at the grocery store, right? So you, <laughs> we're in a small community here, right? So you do my, see them. I mean, you my, know these my, residents. My wife has gotten used to the fact <laughs> that at the grocery store, I, I will on occasion see people that I know and that they've, they've got something that they would like to talk about. Yeah. And I really do enjoy that, uh, that interaction. And, and you know, when I talk about finding the joy in, in the job, I mean, that's it for me. I mean, I mean I've learned that when I run down to the grocery store, for example, and I think it would ordinarily be a you know twelve or fifteen minute chore. <laughs> I might not be back for a half an hour. Yeah. Uh, but if but if I'm not, it's because I was having a, a good, worthy discussion with somebody that had something on on uh, their mind. Excellent. And um, I mean, you work with all sorts of groups. I guess uh, the council. Uh, you have the docents. You have the sheriffs. You have Troa. Um, they all come with with. Not necessarily all with differing opinions, but they all come to the council with the direction they want to see the city go, right? Show us. I mean, I mean we've, we've got one. so many different great volunteer groups. I mean, you've got the Rotarians out there. You've you've got uh, you've got local neighborhood groups. You you've got dozens of of organizations out there. That you've got AYSO. You've got uh, they periodically have got specific issues that are specific to them and 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 when they come to you that's one of the challenges of the, of the job is no one council person or no one staff member is an expert on every single topic that's out there and that's why community involvement is so important it helps us make better decisions fairly frequently hear people compliment the amount of work that we put in as council members mm -hmm. for you know what we hope is the betterment of the, of the community I'm very quick to point out there's plenty of people out there that work just as hard as we do. They just don't, you just don't see them. They're just quietly out there putting their, 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 their heart and soul into making their community better and they're not looking for public recognition or, or accolades. So I'm very quick to try to find those people and have them get the accolades because what they do is every bit as important as what we do on council. 
this council does not vote unanimous every time. <laughs> That's actually a good thing. When, when you've got governmental bodies that are in charge of, of uh, oversight and accountability, if you've got nothing but or the preponderance of votes are unanimous, then I start wondering how much are they into just lockstep agreement for the sake of agreement. I personally think split votes, 3-2 votes, 4-1 votes are a good thing. They're a healthy thing. And we should, in, we should embrace a minority view and agree to disagree uh, on it. So uh, I'm, I think people who follow the council know that uh, I, I appreciate a good, robust debate. But then once we have all the facts on the table, let's take a vote on it, decide what we're going to do as a matter of policy, and move forward. Sometimes we will vote a certain way and it'll be back in front of us six months later and we'll take a different point of view on it because some policies that we enact in reality aren't as effective or didn't accomplish what we had intended them to do and so we need to revisit them and that's when you revisit your approach earlier and you might change your vote on it once you're better educated with with additional information. Mayor Campbell, many of us know that you've been in the Army. So much of your time as a civilian now is also dedicated to military service. What, what made you make that decision? It's a combination of a number of factors. I have been involved for a number of years with uh, different disabled veteran groups, helping them make the transition from the military back to the civilian life. I was asked to serve on a state uh, commission, uh, the okay. Disabled Veterans uh, Business Advisory Group. And as I got more involved with helping veterans, at the same time, my two boys, I have two children, were growing up and becoming young men. And I started thinking more about what I could do to show them what's possible with their lives. And as they got older and stronger, I'm a pretty involved dad. Yeah. Uh, we hike a lot. I needed to get in better and better condition myself in order to keep up with them. And that combined with really seeing how military service matters prompted me to explore getting back involved in the reserves. So as of a couple of years ago, I rejoined and I had the opportunity of spending some of my spare time each month with some of the finest men and women this country uh, produces. So uh, I, I serve in the California State Military Reserve, commonly called the State Guard, mm -hmm. and I'm the executive officer of the Special Operations Support uh, Detachment. So we get to work with some, some very, very experienced professionals uh, in the military. and. Um, and I think it's setting a good example for my kids as, as, as to what's possible. I mean, to put a little bit of light on it, yeah. I'm the second oldest soldier in my unit. And at this point in my life, if you were just to look at things on paper, I've got no business being a soldier. I mean, <laughs> but it's, it's such a challenge. And to, to rise to that level that they hold themselves to, yeah. and it's such a great way, I think, that I can show my own kids and perhaps other kids that regardless of where you are in your life, regardless of what you have done before or how old or even how young you are, don't ever let other people's restrictions or preconceptions hold you down from something that you really have a passion to do. So serving in the military has always been a passion of mine. Uh, it matters and hopefully when my kids are talking about their relatives to their kids and their grandkids, I don't think that they're going to talk about me, about what I did for the majority of my professional life, which is the commercial real estate business. I think the topic of conversation is going to revolve around did you know grandpa or great grandpa, whoever it is they're talking to, I think it's going to revolve around that they served their country in the military, they served their community on the city council, 
they were always there as a coach and and stayed active with him as as long as he could. So that's what that's a, that's a long answer to your question as to as to the complicated reasons and good reasons that I went back and got back in uniform. I didn't expect a short answer from it. It's it's complicated. Yes, you told me something about how when you were in uniform, you met somebody that you'd been working side by side for a while who found out what you do in your civilian life here in RPV. Tell me about that. One of the soldiers that I, that I work with and I see uh, uh, frequently didn't realize that I was on the city council here in Rancho Palos Verdes and he, <laughs> and he called me up and he said, I can't believe you, know, you never <laughs> told me you know, when we're on active duty on, on some weekend. And I said, well, because what I do in my civilian life or what I do on, on the city council isn't relevant to our mission, to our job when we're in uniform. And so uh, that was a, sort of a funny instance of, of just keeping what we do separate uh, mm -hmm. and, and appropriately, uh, appropriately so. Speaking of your military service, I hear that you're going to be doing a lecture at the Peninsula Seniors uh, Lecture Series, which is at Hess Park on Wednesdays. Uh, right. When, when what's that presentation for the Peninsula Seniors going to be about? That's September 27th, and 27th. I'll be giving it along with an anti-terrorist expert, and I'll be talking about the role of the California State Military Reserve Special Operations Group within the overall military structure, and then we will segue into a discussion, a presentation, and discussion of current trends in domestic and international terrorism, what the responses are by the first responders, what we all can do as individuals and as a community to be better prepared. So wow. I think it'll be an interesting presentation and discussion and, and questions afterwards, and that is later on this month. And uh, September 27th, and, and to note, you know, the Hess Park, it's the Peninsula Seniors Lecture Series, but I know that they invite all residents can come and see your presentation. So anybody, anybody who would like to sometimes. come, <laughs> anybody who would like to come and attend is, is welcome. You don't have to necessarily be a senior. Okay, so your term as mayor and as a city council member is ending soon. What's next for you, Mayor Brian Campbell? December 5th is our last night on council, uh, Anthony Misatich and myself. I enjoy working for the public. I decided to run for one of the seats on the Palos Verdes Library District Board of Trustees. And as I was the only one that filed for that seat, then I will be sworn in and take up that position as a library trustee beginning right after my service is done as a councilman in Rancho Palos Verdes. And the Palos Verdes Library District encompasses all four cities here in Palos Verdes and part of, uh, in the unincorporated Los Angeles County space, it's about right. 70,000 residents. And I'm, and I'm really excited about the new technology, the new services that they are rolling out. Our yeah. library district is is very much used, and we've got a terrific uh, managing director and Kathy Gold over there that uh, that does a, a superb job. And I'm looking forward to contributing whatever I can from an experience or expertise standpoint to help continue to keep our library district as great as it is. I mean, I, I take language lessons online uh, through through the library right. district, and, the, and and this is top of the line type technology that we've got. So I'm pretty excited about it. All right. Well, I guess we'll see what the future holds, and um, I know that we will have more shows as your uh, term runs out, <laughs> and we'll have an end of uh, the year program on your career in December. Um, so. Uh, Mayor Brian Campbell, thank you so much for coming in and talking with us here on RPV City Talk. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. It's always a pleasure. And for RPV City Talk, I'm Mark J. Dottie. We'll see you next time.